Welcome. It is, a, it is an honor and a privilege tonight for the Screen Actors Guild Foundation's conversation series to have a legacy interview with a wonderful actor, author, and activist, and a mom of a very wonderful, fabulous actress and son-in-law. Would you give a big, great, warm welcome to Ms. Tiffy Hedren. This is an actors group, and welcome. Excellent. I mentioned uh, in the uh, green room that uh, we'd start uh, perhaps in the beginning. You grew up in uh, Minnesota? I did. Yes. What kind of uh, childhood uh, do you recall having? Um, really very, very normal. Um, uh, my, well, not an affluent family at all. Right. Um, and it was just after the Depression, you know, so it was... Uh, you know, who, how would I know sure. at that age, you know, those little young ages, but my, my parents never laid anything heavy on my sister and me, so it was wonderful. And we were uh, brought up Lutheran. Uh, I went to Sunday school and uh, um, catechism and mm -hmm. was, was confirmed and, you know. Did you have any idea at that time that you thought that you might want to become an actor? Not a clue. In fact, in, in the little town we lived, there was not even a theater. Uh huh. So no, I. Do, do you remember what your the first time you might have seen a play, or you went to the movies then? Mm, that was after I, I, I lived in Lafayette, uh -huh. Minnesota, which is in southern Minnesota, and then we moved to Minneapolis, uh -huh. and uh, it was probably probably then I don't remember though. Mm -hmm. I was too interested in ice skating. Were you? Yes. Were you a skater? Yeah. Well, I wanted to be. Uh huh. Sonia Henney? Uh, yeah, <laughs> exactly. And uh, my parents didn't, ha didn't have the money to send me to classes so uh -huh. to do the figure skating. So I, I went with a friend of mine, and uh, several of my friends were in, you know, taking lessons and all that. And I'd sit on the side and watch them. And, uh -huh. and then, uh, you know, with 10,000 legs, they're everywhere. Sure. So yeah. I'd get and home and cold. put on my little <laughs> skates and, you know, go out onto one of the legs and practice and practice and practice. Uh -huh. But it never came to fruition because uh, one year I had to have an operation on my foot, uh -huh. my left foot. And uh, so in, in those days, they didn't just say right out off of the operating table, right. get up and walk, you know. Uh, so that they said you, I, you, I couldn't skate for the rest of the year. And, um, uh, and then something else happened to me and I couldn't skate for the rest of the year. Oh, appendectomy. An uh -huh. acute app, app, it's not cute at all right. either. No. Uh, there's nothing cute about no. it. Uh, so they said I couldn't couldn't skate for the rest of the year. And then it just sort of... Kind of you know, went by the wayside. Yeah, but then uh, I was about 15 or 16. I got off the, the streetcar coming home from high school at West High School in Minneapolis. And a lady handed me her card. And she said, would you have your mother bring you down to Donaldson's department store? We'd like to have you fashion, be a fashion model in our Saturday morning fashion shows. That's what started the whole That's thing. And yeah. she, just, she just saw you getting onto the bus, uh, yes, uh, getting, getting off, getting of the, off bus the streetcar. And, and just was, happened to have been there? Yes. Is, that's amazing. Isn't that, I mean, your isn't whole that a life fun changed story? From totally. that moment? Ella Jane Knott was her name. Uh-huh. And so did you go down and get the job? I you? did, uh -huh. and I, I worked every Saturday, uh -huh. and all I bought was cashmere sweaters. <laughs> <laughs> it drove my father crazy. <laughs> How about your sister? Was she, uh, uh, was she interested at all? Or? Patty, was, yeah. Patty was a, um, uh, really interested in the piano uh -huh. and uh, played the piano very, right. very beautifully. Um, but at that time, she was in high school and very, yeah. you know, High school is a very social time. Mm -hmm. I have two two daughters of uh, at that age, so I recall. So, so you were modeling at the store on yes, Saturdays. Saturdays. Uh, and 
did you then begin to get the idea of, oh, I may want to become a model? Uh, well, is that, how it, that is just what it evolved. Right. Yes. And how did that come about? Uh, because there were well, several people in, in uh, Minneapolis who were photographers, mm -hmm. and, and they would talk to the, you know, to the uh, people at Donaldson's right. for different photographs that they, for newspapers and that sort of thing. And then my parents moved to California and in the middle of high school, and oh, if any of you do that, don't do that to your kids. It's so hard right. to move, you know. And I went from a, a school where we wore bobby socks and loafers and uh -huh. little pleated skirts and cashmere sweaters <laughs> and, um, uh, you know, very simple hairdo and, you know, maybe lipstick. That was right. all. And I went out to California and the place we lived, they were wearing high-heeled shoes, their hair was up to here, yeah. the whole face full of makeup, and I just didn't didn't get it. Right. Where, where in uh, really California? Unhappy. It was in Los Angeles, uh -huh. Los Angeles area. And your your, uh, your dad got uh, relocated for a different yes, job? Yes, he did. So. Yeah, the mm -hmm. winters were, were very hard on sure. him. And so, you, did you start to model out here then? Oh, yes. Uh-huh. And I did. Then, and uh, you took your credits from Minnesota and people started to recognize you uh, right when you got here? Ah, uh, no. 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 <laughs> no. Because, so how did you make that transition? Because from Minnesota, those things were all very local. Sure. You know, the, the photographs that were done. But I still had a book to show. You know. uh -huh. So um, I went to an agent whose name was Rita Leroy. Do any of you men remember her? <laughs> I don't like it. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't. <laughs> and? Wow. And, you know, it worked. Uh -huh. And I worked with her for several years. Uh -huh. And then, of course, the New York was going, come here to be. You know. And so what kind of, what? tell us a little bit more about what kind of modeling you were doing. Uh, it was I all mean, fashion. All fashion stuff yeah, all uh, fashion. for magazines? Magazines, newspapers, uh -huh. you know, that kind of thing. Do you still have a, a collection of those? I early? do, and my mother was so darling. She's collected, she collected everything, put uh -huh. them in books, scrapbooks. Oh, I have, you know, trunks full of, of stuff. stuff. Uh -huh. <laughs> and so then you went from, and so you were modeling here in Los Angeles, and you were saying New York was kind of, uh, you know, uh, calling you. Mm -hmm. uh, was there like a family discussion? Well, should I go or should I not? No, I my parents were always so supportive uh -huh. of whatever I wanted to do, as long as it was legal and, and okay and moral and right. all that. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so they were, they were great. And they, uh, you know, I kind of look back and, you know, I've asked my mother, she's my late mother, right. uh, uh, how, you know, could you have let me go, you know, at 20 years old? And she said, well, if we haven't taught you what you need to know, it isn't going to do any good to gotcha. you. Know, so, you know, they were wonderful. So what was it like for you being born in Minnesota and spending some time in Los Angeles and then all of a sudden finding yourself, not all of a sudden, but finding yourself in New York and starting up a, a modeling career at, you know, at... Uh... Do you know anything about Eileen Ford? Uh, yes. A okay. Little, yes. Do you know what she does with all her girls? Yes. But she puts you may them... want to tell the others who may not. No. <laughs> <laughs> she, she either puts you in the, in the, 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 I don't know if it exists anymore, the Barbizon Hotel for Women, uh -huh. which no men are allowed, yes. uh, or she'll bring you into her own home and have you live there. So uh, Eileen had picked you out or? Well, I sent photographs uh -huh. to Eileen and I, uh, I received a, a time frame right. that I should be there. And um, my then boyfriend's father had just been killed in an air crash. Oh. And so I took the train. Mm -hmm. Because just because it was not a good feeling. Sure. You know, and uh, I had enough money to get me there sitting up on the train for three days. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Keep, me, <laughs> keep me there for a month at the uh -huh. Barbizon and enough money to get home. Uh -huh. And um, fortunately, the first week I made, it was just awesome. It was really? just really wonderful. Um, I slept for two days after I got on, you know, the train, after sure. I got off the train. And, um, uh, and then I went to meet with Eileen on a Monday morning uh -huh. and she right away sent me out to a, um, photographer mm -hmm. and he put me to work that afternoon. Wow. And from then on, it was just, I, it was just wonderful. It was mm -hmm. fabulous. Mm -hmm. Now, well, you, you, you spoke that you came from very humble beginnings or humble mm -hmm. beginnings. And here you are in New York, you're 20, 21 years old around that, uh, and probably making more money than perhaps, I don't know, I don't know if I'm correct in assuming this, your mom or dad. Yes. And, 
Uh, what was that like? Uh, I, uh, well, they were very, very happy for me, and right. I. You know, I I did fun things for them. I bought my daddy a car, and oh, lovely. you know, yeah, it was it was it was great. So, how long were you modeling that. like that? Uh, from nineteen fifty uh-huh. to sixty two <laughs> in New York. Right. And then I uh, uh, I had Melanie in fifty seven. I have to tell you, I Please. never used to talk about years because I would never let anybody know how old I am. Sure. You know? <laughs> and this year was a really big birthday, and Melanie gave me a huge party, and I just announced the whole thing. <laughs> yes. and, so, and, so, since we're filming, <laughs> would you like to announce it tonight? <laughs> and our, our, our photographer, Bill Dow, where are you, Bill? Is he, is he here? Oh, he's hey, back, way back there. Anyway, we have a, a graphic artist who donates all of her work to the, the Roar Foundation. Right. And she said, I've got this great idea for you for a birthday uh, invitation. Mm-hmm. And uh, she says, it's you sitting with a very, very wonderful dress on, sitting on top of the birthday cake uh-huh. and cheering. Ooh. Yeah, so that's what we did. Uh-huh. And it's cute. Some of my, my, some of my, my docents are here right now. And oh, they, they saw the picture. Yeah. And uh, in fact, um, I know at least three girls have been at the Roar Foundation since 1985 or 86. 86. Good for you. Isn't that That's super? terrific? Yeah. Good, good, good. So you, you're modeling, you're doing well. You were modeling for several years then, as you just uh, yes, just mentioned. I did. Uh, and were you uh, at all trying to make a transition into acting yet? Mm-hmm. Uh, were you? No, and you know why? I had, I had offers from the studios. Mm-hmm. But uh, if you'll remember correctly, television in the 50s was hot. Right. And everybody was staying home watching the little black box instead of going to the theaters. Right. And, um, you know, there became a real problem. So for all of the studios. And uh, so every time I was asked to, you know, come out and do a screen test or whatever, mm-hmm. I said, you know, that it, that this isn't a good business move. What if I go out there right. and move out there? And six months later, they say, well, your option is up, you know. Mm-hmm. I didn't want to take that chance. I had Melanie to support. Sure. And uh, but what I did want to do was get out, get her to a place where she could say, "Mommy, I'm going to run out and play. Sure. I want to go out and play." And you can't do that in New York City. Right. I suppose I could have moved out to the suburbs somewhere, but it just seemed time to go back to California. So you, you came back to California, mm-hmm. and so would you start to share the story about how you were introduced to, to Hitchcock, uh, and how you went sure. from being a model and to creating this uh, fabulous film career uh, just from this initial meeting with him? Yeah, it's kind of an amazing story, actually. Uh, I had, while I was in New York, I had done uh, so many commercials. Mm -hmm. And uh yeah, at one time I had 10 of them running at one time, which was (laughs) very good. In fact, I, I had so much money that I took a trip around the world. Oh, my goodness. Took six months off and just kind of, yeah. oh, it was That's why commercials fabulous. paid money, huh? Yeah. There you go. Yeah, I guess they don't anymore. Well, not as, as much, much perhaps. Yeah. What, what kind of commercials were you doing? Yeah, no, please to, go ahead. Yeah, okay. So um, I got back, and I thought I was broke. Uh-huh. And I called my, my person who was taking care of my finances, and I said, oh, What's happening? And he said, oh, don't worry about it. Your, your residuals have been coming in. You've got as much as when you left, so. Oh. <laughs> God bless those residuals. Yeah, really. Yeah. So anyway, uh, Melanie and I moved out to California. Uh-huh. And uh, we stayed with my, with my parents until I found a home. Uh-huh. And I, of course, rented a very expensive home. And, and uh, the career wasn't going as well as it uh-huh. had in New York, so I was getting a little upset about it. In fact, I was really wondering, what am I going to do? I never learned how to type because I didn't want to break my fingernails. <laughs> this is important reason. stuff. Uh-huh. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Um, so um, I thought, what am I going to do? And uh, on Friday the 13th of October, uh-huh. I received a call from uh, Universal, and they said, are you the girl in the Seago commercial, the pet milk product? And I said, yes. And they said, would you come over and bring any film you have and um, uh, your photo book and that mm-hmm. sort of thing? And I said, sure. Sure. So off I went. 
And now, did uh, your heart skip a beat in thinking about what? This no, might because be? I didn't know what it was. Gotcha. I didn't know. You know, yeah. we can't get excited about things we don't know sure. are going to happen. That's right. <laughs> so anyway, I went um, and met with a man named Jerry Feldman, mm -hmm. who was a sort of he was an executive mm -hmm. there, and um, we talked about my being there, and you know, this producer mm -hmm. director had seen a commercial oh. and wanted to know who I was, where I was, and all that. And I said, well, who is it? And he wouldn't tell me, uh -huh. wouldn't tell me. And I tried all during that interview. And funny enough, uh, in this office were all these photographs of Hitch uh, on his TV, you know, that TV guide thing, right, right. Of the Hitch's TV guide, whatever they call right. it. And um, uh, Just right over my didn't head. put it together yet. No, <laughs> Probably a blessing so, in disguise. Sure. Yeah. So then he asked if I would leave the, all of my, um, my script, uh, my uh -huh. uh, photos and, yeah. and uh, the film. So I said, yes, but I will have to have it back very soon. They said, okay, we'll pick it up Monday morning. So all that weekend, I'm thinking, who is this person? Mm -hmm. And uh, I was having a small party, and uh, my agent came, and he knew all about it and couldn't Ooh. tell me. Uh -huh. Yeah. Mort Viner was uh -huh. his name. Uh -huh. And um, so Monday morning I went, and I met another executive mm -hmm. and another one and another one. Uh, at Universal, mm -hmm. and um, they wouldn't tell me all now, day. They what, wouldn't tell looking why. back on it, do you know why? No, why it was so hush? I think you know something. Uh, I think it was a very kind thing Hitch did because mm -hmm. had I known it was Alfred Hitchcock, right? Who would have walked in there? Would it have been me? I mm -hmm. don't know. I mean, because he was, uh, he was so so much. I mean, a, a, a huge entity. Yes in our industry, in this industry. So I think it was very kind of him mm -hmm. to do mm -hmm. that. So I we, um, uh, was then on Tuesday asked to go over to MCA, mm -hmm. which wasn't the big conglomerate it became. It was a mm -hmm. very, very huge you know, talent mm -hmm. um, office. But um, I went over to see Herman Citrin. And uh, he didn't, you know, mince any words. I barely sat down. And he said, I guess you'd like to know who this is. This, you know, I said, yeah. Mm -hmm. And he said, Alfred Hitchcock wants to sign you to a contract. If you agree with the terms, we'll go over to Paramount and uh, meet him. Now, did your heart skip a beat yet? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I yes, it did. So. Uh -huh. Yeah, it did. And um, so we went over to Universal. Uh -huh. And I'm... Um, the office was up the stairs in a building, and uh, there he was standing with his arms under his great belly, looking very pleased with himself. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was just, it was a great conversation. We had, we talked about, we didn't talk anything about movies. Uh -huh. uh, we talked about uh, travel, we talked about wine, a big interest in wine. Right. Um, uh, traveling different places mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. world and that sort of thing. So it was just very cool. And then he brought Edith Head in uh -huh. to meet, so I could meet her. Right. And uh, she started uh, designing a, a wardrobe for me for my personal use. Just right at that moment. Yeah. Now, uh, I kind of jump ahead, but uh, Edith Head, okay. uh, who was a, obviously a great uh, costume designer, oh, she's uh, awesome. she must have been uh, really wonderful. She has a building at Universal. Yes, uh, yes. she does. Uh, deservedly. So. Yes. Um, but uh, wardrobes in both of those, uh, I'm kind of jumping uh, up a lot, but in, in, in The Birds and in Marnie, uh, the costuming is just absolutely terrific in it. Uh, would you agree? Oh, she's, she was an amazing woman, and, and and she was exciting. She was funny. She she was able to twist any director's, uh -huh. you know, to come around to her way of thinking, uh -huh. and uh, I I admired her tremendously. She was a. Did did you have input in uh, in discussing with her? Would she discuss with an actor? This is how she thinks you should you, how you should dress and, and well, so. you see, you have to understand that Alfred Hitchcock was involved with every phase of making mm -hmm. that motion picture. Right. You know, to to when you hear him, as he often said, it's only a movie. That isn't true. Mm -hmm. He was involved with every phase of it, and he had me sit in on meetings with with every department, mm -hmm. which gave me a terrific education. Sure. In uh, because I was a novice. And uh, although I had done a number of commercials, you get technical background, right. but it's entirely different being a, a character mm -hmm. rather than 
holding up something and smiling or whatever. Yeah. And um, so uh, when we were talking, when Edith was talking to uh, Hitch about the, the clothes, mm -hmm. I was right there. Mm -hmm. And it was fascinating. And in every department, it was fascinating. Uh -huh. But um, since we're talking about Edith Head, he, he had his own ideas, very, mm -hmm. very clear ideas of what he wanted for his, you know, his, his leading ladies. Uh, one I thought was absolutely brilliant is that he wanted all of the clothes to be, um, so that they wouldn't be noticeable. You know, they were very kind of <laughs> traditional and, mm -hmm. and uh, um, so that they, you couldn't look, you wouldn't look at the movie and say, oh, that was 19, da, da, da. You mm -hmm. know, you, you couldn't tell. You know, there were, there were, there were things that would be good forever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, in fact, I have some of the clothes that she made, and I still wear them, <laughs> you know, which is one for me. Yeah. <laughs> and one for uh, her, too. And one for said. her, too. Yes, absolutely. You bet. That's great. Uh, but it was interesting, not only um, d does the designer have to wor worry about the scene or the character, right. but they've got to worry about the action, what sort of action is going to take place mm -hmm. in that costume, what kind of, sure. you know, the, the, all these things are very important. And color. Mm -hmm. Color is so important. Mm -hmm. With the, the green dress that mm -hmm. I wear and with a, right. with a jacket, I had six of them, I want you all to know. Because I wear it through the whole film. Right, sure. You know? And uh, she, uh, um, I don't know whether it was Hitch who, who died, decided on this green color. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Edith had called it O'Donnell Green. Uh -huh. And apparently some of those green shades are very calming. Uh -huh. Which is, of course, a juxtaposition of the violence that the birds were right. to portray to all of us. Uh, but and then you know, we'd go off on color, and then Hitch would start telling stories about about how color is so important mm -hmm. in the film. And and one of the best examples, I think, is uh, Dal M. So, oh, oh, right. Uh -huh. Dal M for murder. Um, because when you see Grace Kelly at first, she's in red and she's beautiful and just glamour, just fall down dead glamour. Right. And uh, after the murder, and she is apprehended and all these things, her clothes become more subdued, sure. the colors get mm -hmm. you know, more subdued, and by the end of the film she's in gray, mm. which actually enhances the performance mm -hmm. immensely. Mm. Yeah. That's a it's great insight. Yeah. Uh, so there is a story uh, I believe that I read, if you're correct, that uh, you had a meeting at Chasen's uh, mm -hmm. uh, with uh, Lou Wasserman? Yes, we did. Yes. Could, now, would you tell, tell us that? Yeah. Uh, Make us set the stage. I got to set the stage. Yes, please. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I was well aware of the fact that, that uh, The Birds was being written. Evan Hunt, the late Evan Hunter, uh, was um, at the office all the time, and Hitch was very much involved with the, with the writing. A lot of Hitch is in every script. Mm-hmm. Especially the you know the male leads, right? Uh, and uh, <laughs> he wishes. <laughs> he wished. That's why he choreographed yeah. it all. <laughs> so anyway, I I knew this the bird movie was going on, and it never occurred to me honestly that I would even be considered. Sure. I thought they were he was doing his television shows, and I thought certainly that's what I would be doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, so then Hitch decides to do a screen test. Well, it wasn't just you take a little scene and you know right. read it with you know somebody right. else. It isn't that at all. Uh, it they were good. we did scenes from Catch a Thief, Rebecca, <laughs> and Notorious. <laughs> Three entirely different women. <laughs> Edith Head did the did the clothes. Uh -huh. uh, Bob Boyle did the sets. Robert Burks was there with his entire film crew. Um, well, that must have been very was, intimidating. To, you know, to go you know with, what? You know what? No, really? Yeah. Uh, uh, because Hitch gave me such a sense of security. That's terrific. That had I not had that, I don't think I could have done it. Sure. But he and Alma coached mm -hmm. me. He was not mm -hmm. only my director, he was my drama coach. Sure. Couldn't get better. And uh, on... Uh, Oh, Saturday morning or whatever, uh -huh. I'd go over and, and we didn't live too far apart. Mm -hmm. It was just like five minutes away. Um, I'd go over to their home and Alma and Hitch would uh, go over the scene with me and we'd read it over and over and um, 
uh, and then we talk about the characters and the relationship with the characters. Mm -hmm. And by the time you get up to do the scene, you it's there was very little direction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was amazing. Uh, and so, uh, and then we did, uh, aside from those three scenes, we did uh, sort of extempor extemporaneous mm -hmm. things. And uh, Martin Balsam was flown in to be my leading man. Oh, was he a uh, possible was, contender at that time? Or? I don't think so. Uh -huh. I, I don't think he was, right. but uh, I never heard that. Okay. Uh, he was a terrific actor. Martin ultimate, Balsam. Ultimate, yes. Yes, he was a consummate yes, actor. Wonderful actor. Absolutely, yes. he was. So anyway, all of this was all compiled and put together, and I guess they all sat and watched it, everybody but me. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then they, uh, one day I got an invitation to go to Chasen's for dinner, mm -hmm. which was wonderful. I always liked that. He had, we sat at his table, and Lou Wasserman joined us, and uh, Hitch placed a very, very beautifully packed, wrapped package from mm -hmm. Gump's in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there are any from San Francisco that you know that shop. It's really yes. terribly yes. beautiful. And uh, it was a, a sort of a red oriental box mm -hmm. with the little, you know, the little Japanese flowers. I still have it. Mm. And um, I opened it and it was a, a pin, a golden seed pearl pin mm -hmm. of three birds in flight. Oh. And he said, I want you to play Melanie Daniels in the Birds. It's, it's here. Is that it? I was just going to. That's gonna... it. Oh. That's it. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah, that's awesome. yeah. And then I, and then I had That's ear... a terrific story. It is good. Yeah, it's it? really a good story. Yeah, and then I uh -huh. had earrings uh, yeah. made that are similar. So, uh -huh. you yeah, know, I'm birded up. Uh, <laughs> She's so, a bird, is she? Yes, she yes. is. So, you know, I, I, when he said, we mm -hmm. want you to play Melanie Daniels in The Birds, I just looked at him and I, I oh my God. And I started, you know, my ear, my eyes sure. started to swell up and I looked over at Alma and she was kind of teary eyed. And, and I looked over at Lou Wasserman, one tear. Very conservative man. Right. <laughs> and I looked over at Hitch and he's sitting there looking very pleased with himself. <laughs> yeah, it was great. It was, it was really wonderful. Um, uh, the screen test is in existence. Uh -huh. I have it. It's over at the Academy. We should get a copy here. Yes. That's what we'll we, talk okay, to we can do that. that. Yeah. Yes. That'd be a great idea. Yeah. And um, uh, the um, Rebecca and Notorious had to be destroyed uh -huh. because Hitch didn't own them. Oh, I see. Uh -huh. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned, uh, you know, you're shooting commercials back in New York and you're trying to do them out here. Uh, and you'd go and see Hitchcock, and you would work on the scene and improvise and and uh, discuss about working with character and relationship mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And you show up on the set, you really not had any acting experience no. at, at all. Uh, what was that like for you as a young actor in this big motion picture with your you know your uh, medallion now that you're going to be in this film for you to find a way in how to work? Uh, Obviously, input from him, but how about from your point of view? Um, well, I noticed something uh, when my daughter decided to, right. to be an actress, that there are some people who, who find it very easy yeah. to do this. And, uh, uh, you know, I certainly saw that in Melanie. Right. I mean, her first movie, Night Moves, was she was a pivotal role in it. And she was spectacular. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was, I was amazed and stunned and very proud of her. Uh, but um, Hitch gave, as I said before, mm -hmm. he gave me so much assurance mm -hmm. that it, I found it um, to, to have at least that element knocked out. Right. You know, that I didn't have to, you know, be, oh my God, am I doing this right? Am I, mm -hmm. what am I doing? Because, in fact, he rather liked the fact that I didn't have any past tutoring gotcha. or teaching because I had nothing to unlearn. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, I was so grateful that, I mean, I just wanted to be putty and, you know, mm -hmm. just listen to him and, and do what he requested, you know, and... and so how would, how would he direct you or the other actors uh, in, in a scene in this film? Let's say, uh, just, you know, off the top of my head, picking something, uh, when you come in into the store, and, that's early scene that you have with uh, Rod Taylor. 
uh, pretending that you belong in the store and so on and so forth. I mean, how would he work with you as an actor? How would Tell us what a day, like a shooting would be like. Yeah, um, well, you know, by the time we would get onto the set, right, uh, and we, he didn't re pre-rehearse. You know, some uh. people go re start a couple of weeks before you start filming, right. and you rehearse the whole thing, and you go through, you talk about the scenes and all that. Um, we did that, but not with the whole crew involved. Mm -hmm. I, I would, uh, he would talk to me, and um, I guess that's what he did with everybody mm -hmm. else too, because mm -hmm. by the time we got onto the set, it was it was pretty well mm -hmm. uh, put together. It, it, it's amazing the way he he directed. There is, and I may be incorrect in saying this, so since tell us, is there's a story or somehow I don't know it exactly about how Hitchcock uh, treated actors. Uh, but when I'm hearing, oh, from there's him, a joke about that. It's more of a joke. That they, yeah. It is more of a joke he, uh, because actors were some. Most of the actors were some of his best friends. Oh yeah. You know, uh, the the thing was uh, that they should be that they should be uh, something like treated but like any, cattle, but yeah, or, yeah, or, or, or. Uh, no, because that's what the ultimate thing was that they right. should be treated like cattle, and right. of course that was a, you know one of his funny jokes. That, right. Yeah. It, <laughs> He uh, he grew, you know, Cary Grant and Ingrid oh, and sure. Grace and and um, Jimmy Stewart. Um, you know, yeah. so many of them were yeah. really good, good friends that he would have over to his own home for dinner mm -hmm. and. Uh, yeah. Well, it sounds very much the opposite uh, as what you're saying is that he created a set where you felt uh, empowered to yes. to take chances and to be your own person and yeah. also, you know, obviously he had directed so many great films already. Um, uh, that uh, he obviously knew what he was doing. Yeah, very yeah. obviously. Yeah. Right. And it was all planned out completely. Did Which, he storyboard everything? Or? Yes, he did. Yeah. He, and he would even draw graphs mm -hmm. as to when he, you know, when he was going to pick the audience up and then let them go. And mm -hmm. then, you know, they couldn't. And they, you know. Uh, but the, um, uh, one of the scenes that we did mm -hmm. in The Birds, uh, you know the scene where I go in to bring, the, bring Lydia the tea? Mm hmm. Um, Hitch wanted, to, wanted wanted me to play it very bitchy mm -hmm. and not at all sympathetic. Mm -hmm. and, you know, who cares? Uh, so I did. And uh, after it was assembled and put together, uh, Alma mm -hmm. and uh, um, Jessica Tandy right. went to see it. And she looked at it and she said, Hitch, you know, nobody is going to like this girl. Mm. Nobody's going to like her. Well, by this time, the set had been struck. You know, the I mean, it, it, right. we were on to other things. Sure. And uh, he had the set built back up again. Oh my goodness! <laughs> and uh, we did it over. Mm -hmm. But you know what that did for me? It did more for me in the frame of acting, mm -hmm. because taking the same script, the mm -hmm. same words, the same set. The same people, the same actors, mm -hmm. and doing that whole thing entirely differently mm. was just amazing. And I would suggest that all of you in your classes yeah, try that. Yes. Because it is, it is, it's fun, it's exciting, and um, and it it, I, I, it did make a huge difference. Huge difference. You mentioned uh, Jessica Tandy, who obviously was one of the uh, great. Uh, people of the American theater uh, uh, and, and and a film. What was that like working with her, uh, especially being a young actor who has never acted uh, on stage or in film? And here she was, you know, uh, Blanche and yeah, Streetcar Named Desire. I, I, yeah. Yeah. I mean, she was just terrific. I mean, it was. Uh, it could have been very frightening mm -hmm. for me. I mean, to think of all of these seasoned actors. Yes. And big stars. Yeah. And they were just so terrific with me. I mean, they didn't make me feel that I was a you know a newcomer that didn't mm. know what she was doing. Mm -hmm. Not at all. It was just they were all absolutely wonderful. Now there are wonderful character actors in the birds. Uh, you know, in the the long luncheonette, uh, the scene in the luncheonette, and we mentioned in the green room how he's able to get so many people in frame and have a life going on for each of those characters while a scene is going on, whoever's in the forefront and the background. 
do you recall any of those days and what it was like shooting and uh, and how long scenes would be able to be shot to, before you have to turn the camera around? Uh, Hitch had everything so well planned and meetings prior to everybody mm -hmm. getting onto the, onto the set. Mm -hmm. And with a lot of, a lot of the, the people that are, you see are milling around, mm -hmm. that is, has a great deal to do with the assistant director. Mm -hmm. He does a lot of those things. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jim Brown was very good at it. Mm -hmm. He was excellent at it, mm -hmm. but um, and I'm sure it was with Hitch's, you know, the meetings sure. prior, and that, and that's what he always did. Mm -hmm. He never, I never ever saw him look into the the camera eye, mm -hmm. the eye of the camera. Never. He would um, have meetings with Bob Burks, mm -hmm. the the late Bob Burks, uh, and Bob knew exactly what Hitch wanted, and he. Hitch knew that that's what he would get. And he would sit in a chair, a director's chair? He would chair, sit in a chair. Right, and by yes. the camera? Yes, uh -huh. fairly close. Right. Now, uh, I heard you mention in your interview earlier, uh, uh, we were talking, you were talking about how uh, uh, there were no, um, you know, there's none of the CGI that they have now in the right. film. And so how did they corral who was like who was the, the bird birds. wrangler uh, for the thing? I mean, how did they work out with the real birds that were on the set? Yeah, it was the the late Ray Berwick. Uh -huh. uh, late, a lot of late, aren't there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, that's the way it happens. That's anyway, right. uh, Ray Berwick was a, an incredibly wonderful uh -huh. uh, bird trainer, and he would train one bird at a time, six at a time, a dozen, couple dozen. Right. He'd even chain trade you know, do the flocks right. of, of birds. There was one little raven who could play the piano. No. <laughs> and there was, of course, he, that wasn't what he Get his, an agent. Yeah, well, he, yeah, he probably had one. Uh, uh, the, uh, but the, the, he would, you know, Ray would just show right. them how, show yeah. us how, how, how yeah. well, how easy, well, how learn, learnable right. they are, yeah. which is really pretty awesome. Um, but there was one little, little a young raven who uh -huh. was so sweet he couldn't be in the movie, but he became my buddy, and that was his name. Uh -huh. And he'd jump up on the makeup table, uh -huh. my makeup table, and push all the things around. And and I was smoking at the time, and he'd hold, he would hold a lit, lighted match. Uh -huh. That wasn't my idea. Uh -huh. That wasn't my idea at all. That's so funny. But he was, and he kept hopping up into the, uh -huh. the trailer on the stage, you know, it was really adorable. But uh, let me give you one idea of how sure. much this man cared about, about the birds. Uh, when we were um, uh, up in Bodega Bay mm -hmm. and doing all that, the boat scenes and right. all those sorts of things, uh, one day, and at the party scene with the children, mm -hmm. we always used mechanical birds where mm -hmm. the, they would be on the kids. Right. Uh, but he had trained three seagulls to individually take off from his arm, uh -huh. circle, dive bomb the kids, and come back to his arm. And in order to keep the little the kids safe, he mm -hmm. very loosely wired their beaks. Mm -hmm. Very loosely, so they didn't feel like that. Right. You know, uh, and uh, first bird took off, circled, dive bomb the kids, and came back to him. Second one, same thing. Third one, took off. <laughs> <laughs> And he, Ray Berwick came to Hitch and said, uh -huh. we're going to have to shut down for the afternoon. I have to find that bird. Right. And he did. He got, he got in a rowboat, and he went out on the bay mm -hmm. until he found that bird wow. and took the wire off. And mm -hmm. that bird never had to do another, another Screen Actor Guild contract. <laughs> <laughs> now, now th there, was all, there are all these uh, mechanical birds that were used. Yes. But, uh, if the story is correct, uh, uh, one time they were not working. Was it in the attic scene? Uh, yeah. Where they did you, do you know, they told me, because when, you know, when you read the script, you read the whole script. Right. And you work on it because when you're an actor, you have to know what, what you've done in the scene before, even if you haven't done it. Sure. It has to be very planned. I kind of envy the Broadway actor who can mm -hmm. just go, you know, can build and all of that. This, mm -hmm. this is a lot more demanding than those stage mm -hmm. actors have any idea, being a no screen actor. Um, uh, Question was, we, we were talking about uh, using uh, real birds in the attic scene. Yeah. If that's okay, so yeah. I read the script and I said to Hitch, so how are we going to do this? 
knowing all those real birds were out there being trained to attack sure. and all that. <laughs> and uh, he said, well, we'll use mechanical birds. Don't, don't, no problem. Okay, so I, what's no big deal. Mm -hmm. Don't have to feel apprehensive about anything. So the morning, we, the rest, we started that scene on a Monday morning. Hitch told me it would be a five-day thing. They wanted mm -hmm. to, he wanted to kind of match it to the shower stabbing scene. Right, yes. You know, that you kind of thing. So I go, I'm sitting in my dressing room getting, you know, just waiting for the call to go out to set. And Jim Brown came in, the assistant director. Mm -hmm. And he looked at the floor, and he looked at the walls, and he looked at the ceiling. And, I'm, mm -hmm. and he's, you know, kind of fidgety. And I said, what's the matter with you? And he said... The mechanical birds don't work. They, we have to use the real ones. And out the door he went. <laughs> <laughs> Not a nice thing to do. <laughs> so I went out to the set, and they had no intentions of using uh, fake birds. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't all of a sudden just have a, a you know, chain link mm -hmm. fence around the set. Sure. You don't all of a sudden have three cartons of seagulls and ravens and a few, and a few pigeons thrown in. And I thought, oh, you know, this is actually, I'm glad I didn't have to worry about this scene sure. all that time. Now, it was the, it was the attic in the, in the attic scene when they did this? Uh -huh. yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, because you really see if you're looking, uh, but I mean, they're really birds. Oh, they are. Yeah. yeah. Yes, they are. Uh, did you get uh, snipped at all? Or? Sure. Yeah. And at the uh, the end of that particular scene, uh -huh. I'm on the, gr on the floor. Right. And um, in fact, I'm right up to the door and yeah. and uh, they hitch wanted birds all over me. Mm -hmm. And so Rita Riggs, who was my dresser, Right. Uh, before I put the dress on, she put bands around my body, right. and there were little elastics, two little elastics sticking out every uh -huh. every now and then, and she'd pull those through the green, the holes in the green dress, mm -hmm. and uh, then I would get on the floor, and then they tied the birds to me. Oh. Yeah, that was good. So <laughs> about three three o'clock in the afternoon, one of them jumped. Because they could move with the yeah. elastic, you know, it was just one one of their feet, and uh, one of them jumped from here up to my eye, and it was way too close. Right. And I just got them all off of me, and and just burst into tears, and everybody left. They just left me there. Oh my goodness. And then was that happened? awful? Oh yeah. <laughs> Couldn't get away with that now, I bet. No. No, no, no. no. I think this is why he's cho chosen unknown to do this movie. <laughs> so he says, I got a little sucker here. Yeah. So, uh, but it was it was awful. And yeah. I, it was it was just from sheer exhaustion. Oh yeah. And I had um, uh, I met a couple uh, who I uh, modeled with. Uh -huh. I modeled with the, the woman, and uh, her <coughs> husband was a doctor. And I had a drink with him at the mm -hmm. Beverly Hills Hotel before I went back to Westwood. And uh, he later said, he said, I've never seen a human being as mm -hmm. tired. Ooh, yeah. right. And I had Melanie to take care of because it mm -hmm. was the weekend. I, I'm not sure, I don't remember that weekend, right. I drove to Universal on Monday morning. Mm -hmm. I don't remember driving. I got into my dressing room mm -hmm. and laid down on the chaise, and uh, nobody could wake me. Oh, my. So somebody carried me to a, some vehicle mm -hmm. and drove me to my home and carried me up the stairs, and, and uh, I don't remember anything. Wow. Now this is during, uh, in between. Uh, oh, it was. was it, oh, while you were well, it was. Yeah. But if you look at that movie, uh -huh. there aren't many scenes I'm not in. I know. Yeah. And I mean. so when the doctor said, um, "I'm sorry, Mr. Hitchcock, she can't work for this mm -hmm. week," and he said, "But where she has to, we have nothing else to shoot." And he said, "What are you trying to do, kill her?" <laughs> <laughs> so I got the week off. Oh, good. <laughs> I did. That was good. Now. Uh, after watching that movie and having, you know, as a child, seeing the movie and, and, and just seeing it the other day, anytime I'm outside after that and I see a gaggle of birds come together. <laughs> now, did you have, after it was over, kind of have a, some kind of a leftover feeling from being in that film with the birds? No, 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 no. For, first <laughs> just of all, me? First of all, they're called flocks. Right. 
And, uh, I knew that. You knew that. <laughs> I know. You knew that. I just see if anyone else was paying attention. <laughs> and I'm delighted yeah. that it scares you. We uh -huh. worked very hard to do that. Yes. <laughs> that was amazing. But I have no phobias whatsoever. Yeah. In fact, at Shambhala, we have right. huge numbers of, of uh, raven who live mm -hmm. there because they're meat eaters. Right. And, uh, you know, when you're feeding lions all this meat, it's what a great place to live. Sure. And you see them coming down and they pick up the meat right in front of a lion. Mm -hmm. They kind of goes, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> you girls know that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so last thing on the birds, because so, we have other things to cover. Uh, after the film came out, I don't know, had you started Marnie yet? No. no. Hitch told me when we were filming the birds. Right. In fact, I remember it well. It was the, the scene where uh, uh, Rod Taylor, right. Mitch, and I walk up to, on the kind of knoll, uh -huh. and we have a martini, and, and um, we have that, that scene mm -hmm. up there and where I decide that I should go and join the other children. Sure. Um, that was the day that he told me that I was going to play uh, Marnie. Mm. And uh, you know, all that time I thought, how are they going to? How are they going to have Grace Kelly? How would the principality of Monaco let their princess play a compulsive thief, mm -hmm. a liar, a cheat, so frigid she screams if a man comes near her? How would they do that? And mm. sure enough, they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't. So how how when when the movie came out and it was a such a big success. How, how did your life change uh, for you? I mean, I mean, because this is such a dramatic difference from what you were doing before oh, yes. and, and now doing this. Uh, I I was enjoying all of it very mm. much because um, it was it was exciting. It were exciting people, and you know, a lot of a lot of travel, which I mm. love, and um, it was it was. Of course, I had Melanie, which, which brings you right down to sure. this is what it's really all about. Yes. You know? And uh, but it was it was it was good. It, it um, you know there's a lot of a lot of hurt in mm -hmm. the business too. You know, and especially uh, the fact that the executives at um, Universal mm -hmm. were really not pleased with the fact that that this novice was given, getting mm -hmm. these great roles. And uh, that I hadn't yet had any kind of real big box office. Mm -hmm. You know, I wasn't a big box office name. It was, you know, it was it, we were sort of on the road mm -hmm. to to doing that. And uh, you know, it's it's rare now that a, a studio gets behind somebody. Mm -hmm. These most of them are independent films, and the actor doesn't have the opportunity to do film after film after film to gain that that kind of uh, push, mm -hmm. you know, so uh, I was well aware of the fact that, that all of this was going on behind mm. without being told to me, you right. know, to my face. Uh, but I, I, again, go back to the fact that Hitchcock thought I felt I could do it. Mm -hmm. that it was in me to do it. Well, fortunate. Yeah. yeah um, so you go over, uh, you're going to start to do uh, Marnie next and get to work with uh, Sean Connery. Um, what was that like uh, working with him? Uh, had had he gained that great notoriety? I mean, had he was just out of Doctor No. Doctor No had just yeah. had, and had, it had and, come out already. Oh, he was right. hot. Yes. Yeah. In more <laughs> ways than one, babe. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So you know, all this time uh, that uh, Hitch is looking for Mark Rutland. Right. And uh, oh, he went to he watched everybody, mm -hmm. uh, every great actor from Marilyn, Marlon Brando on, you know. Yeah. Uh, and finally one day he said, I've found Mark Rutland. I said, great, who is it? And he said, Sean Connery. And I went, Sean Connery. Uh -huh. Here I am playing a frigid woman who <laughs> screams, <laughs> screams every time a man comes near her. <laughs> I said, how am I supposed to pull this off? <laughs> he could melt the iciest of blondes. <laughs> and he said, it's called acting, my dear. <laughs> that was that. <laughs> but Sean was, Sean was, was wonderful. Right. I mean, he was really, he was, he was so interested in his, he had just started to practice golf. Mm -hmm. 
And all we ever saw of him was when he was ready to do the scene and, right. you know, he didn't hang around mm -hmm. the set at all um, because he was out there either putting or whatever amount of distance he could sure. find, you know. Sure. So he was, he was very involved in that and it worked. Mm -hmm. One of, one of the things in uh, Marnie that, uh, that Hitchcock made a creative choice on that I'd ask you to maybe give us uh, some feedback on is that he has scenes, let's say, at the, race, uh, at the racetrack mm -hmm. where you're, that there's, you know, I don't know whether it was the, the second unit that went and shot the racetrack job, but then he came back and would put you back into the studio. Yes. Uh, what was his uh, artistic reasoning for that, if any? It's very simple. Control of the lighting. Really? Yes. I mean, we did all those scenes up in Bodega Bay. Right. And uh, all of that was done uh, in the, the interiors are all done mm -hmm. in the studio. Right. Because nowadays they would, you know, be able to compensate or deal with that. Uh, but he needed that control. He never yes. felt that. That's interesting. Yes, he felt he did. it didn't matter what your age was. Lighting is right. ultimate. I mean, you have to have good lighting. Sure. Because he wanted his, his people to look really good. Now, the other thing, yeah, and, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's okay, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Uh, uh, one, of the, one of the other things that I noticed, and especially in watching these first two films, and you kind of, we passed it uh, when you were talking about being on the bus in Minnesota, is that uh, your hairstyle in mm -hmm. those two films. Uh, do you look back on that? Uh, uh, what's your, when you look back on it, how do you think about that? Uh, it was that a pain in the neck. It was. Yes. I mean, you had a lot of hair up there. Yeah. They didn't see, yeah. It was a lot, and it was a lot of, um, a lot of work to get it. Right. You know, a lot of time. Now it's all very flippy and, you know, right. great. But I, for Marnie, uh, we went to Paris, and uh -huh. uh, the hairstylist, Alexandra, Alexandra, mm -hmm. uh, did all of the styles. Uh -huh. And I think what Hitch liked about him so much is he had done sketches of the different hairstyles that uh -huh. he thought, and they were so perfect. I mean, just like, I mean, I've got them framed. They're so beautiful. I should send a set down here, too. Yeah. And I have two, th two gowns that Edith Head did mm -hmm. for me. Yeah, from, from I'll send, that, yeah. Yeah, we should talk about them. Yeah. Talk, have someone talk. Um, uh, what about your scene, that breakdown scene uh, towards the end of the film? Uh, you mean with the mother, with Louis yes. Latham? Yes. Would, would you want to talk about... Uh, you, know, you know how he yes, decided that, that he wanted us to, to, you know, the feeling right. that we both had. When he said, like, just imagine two fighters who have gone 20 rounds mm -hmm. and fight, nobody wins, mm -hmm. but they just finally sit down and look at each other and... They let go. Yeah. Yeah. Was that difficult doing those scenes? No, that it's scene? great fun yeah. to do those things. Mm. Acting, you know, acting is a is a really wonderful, wonderful career to mm -hmm. have, and uh, you know, it, it's it uh, sometimes it's very difficult mm -hmm. to do the scenes, uh, but it's always <laughs> interesting. It's always exciting would, and fun. Would you expand on why acting is such a wonderful career to have? I mean, you've been very fortunate to have had yes, have. a very successful uh, creative uh, career for yourself. But uh, for actors who are, you know, working actors, character actors, may not have had that opportunity, there is great honor and nobility in being an actor. Uh, mm -hmm. Would you share your thoughts on that? Uh, I think I, exactly, it is exactly how I feel because it is a, um, an amazing occupation to mm -hmm. have. And it's it's fascinating in the different characters that you get to delve into, and and um, uh, I just wish there were more opportunities mm -hmm. for everybody, mm -hmm. because I know there are so many incredibly wonderful actors who mm -hmm. never really get a chance, never have you know whatever star it is that falls into your mm -hmm. uh, into your being that allows you to have the magic and whatever uh, has to revolve around that to make you um, a star or mm -hmm. a celebrity, whatever. It's, it's, it's very difficult and it's very disappointing. Mm -hmm. It's extremely disappointing. Yes. And, and you, I think actors are the most persevering people. Uh, and I 
I applaud that. Right. Yeah. And believe me, I know what it's like not to get the role. Mm -hmm. um, were there um, things up later on in your career that you were up for you didn't get? Sure. Would you share sure. any of those? Um, well, I, I tend not to dwell on them because right. it's not a very, very happy kind of thing, and right. uh, uh, so I, you know, I don't, I don't. Uh, I know that the one that really hurt the most was the Francois Truffaut film, mm -hmm. and that was shortly after I did uh, the Countess of Hong Kong, mm -hmm. and I would hear from different directors and producers right. that they wanted to use me in a film, mm -hmm. but that I wasn't available. You know, which is it, mm -hmm. very, very heartbreaking and, and uh, that sort of thing. So it is, it is not an easy. No. Uh, you've got no. to have a really tough shell, mm -hmm. and you can't ever let anybody know that you feel that way because that's not good form. Mm -hmm. And um, it's 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 tough. It is tough. Uh, you mentioned the uh, the Countess of Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. uh, which was uh, Charlie Chaplin's last film. Yes. Um, you know, uh, I mean, you've gone from never having acted before and working with two icons in, mm -hmm. uh, in the American motion pictures of Alfred Hitchcock and now Charlie Chaplin. Would you, and needless to say, acting opposite uh, Marlon Brando. Yes. Um, and Sophia. And, yes, yeah. Gosh. How she, could you forget Sophia? Well, no, I, I didn't forget her. <laughs> she, she, she was and is so beautiful. She I mean, is. it's like it, she's just such a knockout. Yeah, I mean, she is. Just, not to say that you're not, my darling. <laughs> good, uh, good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but you. <laughs> Uh, t tell us about uh, Charlie Chaplin. I mean, he also seemed to have choreographed. I mean, I, I know the uh, uh, choreographed much of how the actors behave in the film. Oh, I thought. we know where the film was. It wasn't in in the, the film itself. It was watching Charlie direct. Really? Yeah, because the way he directed, he would get up and and act out all the different roles, <laughs> and good. Right. I mean, he was excellent. He'd become Sophia Loren. He'd become Marlon Brando. He'd become... This didn't go over with Marlon at all. I was going to say that. <laughs> in fact, uh, yeah, in fact uh, uh, none of us were given a script. We uh -huh. were just told because Charlie wouldn't let a, a script out of uh, London, out of his office, right. even. And uh, so we were told what the character was, what the, the plot was, what the, mm -hmm. you know, all the stuff that you would ask over the phone, mm -hmm. and who would turn Charlie Chaplin down? Anybody here? <laughs> so anyway, we all got over there, and then the script was given to, it, mm -hmm. to us. Well, Marlon read the script and promptly got the flu. Oh. And um, I read the script, and I had been told that uh, I would play Marlon's wife, and we were estranged, and uh, he was an ambassador, mm -hmm. and he was um, a charming man, mm -hmm. wealthy, you know, and so, so was I. And so, and, and that I would come in halfway through the script, and then I would be in the script mm -hmm. from then on. I'm done. Yeah. So, I'm looking for Martha. Mm -hmm. I get to the set, and I went right from the plane to the set because mm -hmm. I was, I, I mean, this was really fun. Yeah. And it was on the way, and I said, oh, let's stop off. And um, so uh, Charlie was wonderful, and Sophia was wonderful. Everybody was just great. Marlon wasn't around. Sure. And uh, so uh, after we chatted for a while, I said, oh, let me have a script. And he, they gave me, handed me the script, and they all left. <laughs> so I was sitting there, and I'm looking. I kind of page go, page. <laughs> go through, and I kind of pick up maybe a little sooner yeah. than halfway through, and I'm paging, looking for Martha. Looking and looking. About the last quarter, yeah. and I have like four scenes. Yeah. So I say, ah, oh, what's going on here? Uh, Why? Why? I mean, if he had said, would you come over and do a cameo? Mm -hmm. I would have said, and every actor sure. in the world wanted to be in Charlie's last film. They were offering, big, huge stars were offering to do walk-ons mm -hmm. for no money. Hmm. So anyway, I, I asked him about that, and he said, well, why don't you come over and have dinner with Una and me? And I got there, and Una had the flu. Uh. 
So I, you know, I, and my then husband was with mm -hmm. me, and and uh, I said, Charlie, why didn't you just tell me that mm -hmm. it was a cameo role? And he said, I didn't think you'd come. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Now, I had heard that he was a very charming man and to beware, you know. Uh, but I, there was such a kind of honesty about mm -hmm. that that I thought, oh, okay. <laughs> well, I'm here now anyway. You know, so. I'm here, so why right. not? Yeah. Just but a, I'm sorry. I have to tell you another yes. thing. You know, with, with um, um, uh, the Screen Actors Guild Foundation doing all of this mm -hmm. work with the actors, it is so wonderful that... that this is being done uh, because it wasn't you know at the beginning of movies nobody thought to even save the films sure you know so uh, this is really wonderful and while I was in London Hitch and Alma came mm -hmm. and so I had tea with them and uh, uh, I said oh Hitch you know what would be really wonderful if if you and Charlie would get together and have photographs taken. I said, every, every, wow. every photographer in the world would be here for that, to have the two of you English giants in the film business together. Right. He said, why would I want to do that? <laughs> and I said, oh, silly me, why? I don't, <laughs> I don't know. I just thought it would be a really great idea. <laughs> Wouldn't have anything. He didn't like to share. He didn't. <laughs> now, just uh, so, so people would may or may not know this, that uh, uh, Chaplin's wife Ona was Eugene O'Neill's daughter. Yes. Right. And O'Neill, yes. uh, uh, O'Neill was not happy in the in, in the beginning, at least, that uh, she was going to marry him. Yeah. yeah. Um, you also see in in uh, the Countess of Hong Kong, especially in the. Um, uh, the the sequences of you know running back and forth in the in the in the cabin that you can see Brando's performance is almost his imitation of Chaplin's oh, Chaplin. imitation doing Brando in it isn't that yeah, right yes uh, yes uh, exactly I mean the double takes and, and very much against the training that he had as a method uh, studio guy of uh, you know and was he he was not pleased about doing that or no he wasn't no, in fact I can he imagine. in fact he really wanted to get out of it really yeah and of course he had signed contracts and all of that so he still persisted and charlie finally said okay marlon you call a press conference i'll call a press conference we'll see who wins this battle really mm -hmm. yeah so marlon weathered it through right and he even went back over for the opening uh -huh. Now, that may have been in the contract. Right, yeah. <laughs> I would suspect that that's what it is. And also, uh, Geraldine Chaplin's got a little cameo in, yes, the, in, the, uh, in one of those dance yes. sequences. She kind of flies by dancing. So yes, and that was, that's his son, isn't it? Sydney? Yes, Sydney. Sydney is right, is his son. Yeah. Um, you, went, you, you know, we're spending so much time early on in your career, and I don't want to, uh, I mean, there's a lot of, you know, did a lot of famous work at the time. But you've, you've had a, you know, a two, three decade career mm -hmm. as, as a, an actor making your way from, uh, you know, these very well-known motion pictures and then working in television mm -hmm. uh, and episodic television and continuing to make films. What was it like for you being able to go back and forth uh, as well as raising uh, Melanie as having a family as an actor? Uh, busy. But it, um, uh, there was a, there was a period where I really didn't do much of anything, and that was that was, by choice. That was no, it wasn't actually. Mm -hmm. It wasn't by choice. It was that uh, um, uh, there had been a little bit of a problem, and right. so I, you know, I just that was the time when it was I wasn't available. Right, and it was very 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 hurtful. Mm. And, uh, what did you do? Difficult. To, and you were talking about perseverance before. What were you doing to maintain your own personal perseverance to to keep going on and not give up? I did a I did a lot of, of um, volunteer work, mm -hmm. you know, for different different uh, foundations, and, mm -hmm. and um, one of them was uh, uh, food for the hungry, mm -hmm. and uh, that was very very in incredibly. Difficult at times because mm -hmm. what what Food for the Hungry did was go to different areas of the world that had been struck by, oh maybe a major hur hurricane, mm -hmm. a major uh, earthquake, 
um, the the uh, droughts in the Sahel of mm -hmm. Africa, the, uh, after the war in Bangladesh, all of those things that people need aid. Mm -hmm. And um, the purpose of Food for the Hungry was not only just to put a Band-Aid on the situation mm -hmm. by, oh, making sure food was there and, mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. They, they really took a hold of, the, of who needed the help, did they need their houses built up, and they mm -hmm. put they they started self help programs. You know that that whole thing. You can feed a man with a fish, but mm -hmm. if you teach him how, he can take care of himself. Mm -hmm. And that's what we were trying to do: mm -hmm. is build up their their own moral and, mm -hmm. and physical stance again, as well as building them their homes back. Mm -hmm. You know, getting their um, some sort of a vocation so they could take care of themselves and. That was very gratifying, mm. and traveling all over the world, it was very hard. You know, I've held little babies in my hands that were nine months old and weighed six pounds, mm -hmm. and they were still alive. Mm -hmm. It's going on now again. Yes, yeah. oh, and always will until, yes. you know, if we can ever get our acts together to have uh, a meeting place of peace and harmony for mm -hmm. all beings, animal yeah. and human. Yes. <laughs> and I got some out in there. <laughs> Are you a spiritual person? Uh, oh, I think so. Uh -huh. I think I am. Uh, and practice a so. spirituality for yourself? Yes, I do. Uh -huh. Yes, I do. And, and, and did that come about uh, either from your upbringing or as <laughs> life went on and you saw the adversity that the world... Any one of the above. Right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> there's a little note in here, and I read it online as well, about how you are responsible for the Vietnamese hair salons, fingernails, fingernail, right. Now, that's a strange, funny story. Would, funny? You, would you let us know yeah. what that's about? Yes, this, well, this is one of the projects that Food for the Hungry did. Uh -huh. And um, uh, when the uh, Vietnamese, uh, when Saigon fell, mm -hmm. all of these, all of the, so many of the Vietnamese were mm -hmm. getting in these ridiculous little boats and trying right. to survive. and. And they were trying to get airlines out and uh, airplane reservations, and it was, you know, it was just mm -hmm. really awful. Larry Ward, uh, the late Dr. Larry Ward, was uh, in Vietnam a great deal of the time mm -hmm. that the war was on. I never, I, I didn't, I went at, on USO tours mm. and um, met some wonderful people. One is uh, Q Ching, who is a very beautiful Vietnamese mm -hmm. woman who had everything there. She mm -hmm. had her own, she was a huge Asian film star. She had her own production company, her own television show. She had a wonderful husband, a, three beautiful children. And uh, all of a sudden, it, she lost everything. Uh, however, she had sent the children to school in, in uh, Canada. So they were safe. And she got out. And all this time, we had become friends from the first USO tour I did in 66, mm -hmm. and then I did another one in 68, and I met Ching on the first one. And so we saw again, saw us again in 68, saw, us, saw each other. And, um, and so we correspond and, you know, that sort of thing. And so after the fall, I didn't hear from her, and I was becoming very worried. And then I got a call from her, and she was in Canada. Mm. She had somehow right. gotten there. And she was crying, and she said, "I feel so frustrated. I've called some of the um, some of the people that I knew, mm -hmm. you know, Americans, and nobody can help. Nobody can help me." I said, "Don't worry. Just give me your phone number." And through the, through Food for the Hungry, we brought her in. Mm. And at that same time, uh, we had a, a place outside of Sacramento at Weimar, mm -hmm. California, and it was an abandoned tu tuberculosis sanitarium. Of course, there was no need for it mm -hmm. at that time. So there were all these barracks that were uh, uh, up in the mountains with the pine trees, and it was just beautiful. The Vietnamese uh, sort of felt it was like a, a vacation area called mm -hmm. De Lat Which is? in Vietnam. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And uh, so we taught, uh, we helped these women and men get um, get a sponsor. We took them to the supermarkets, which they were, all these things were foreign to them. Helped them get driver's licenses, helped them with everything we could. And um, we, uh, I noticed that the, the women were very, very adept with their hands, and they're good business women. Mm -hmm. They're very, very good. So I had a seamstress come in, and uh, we taught some of them how to sew, 
which is good. And then I thought, wait a minute, the, you know, the fabric, you know, mm -hmm. the nail wraps are becoming mm -hmm. so popular with women because, you know, you can grow your own nails and they're there and you don't have to keep worrying about them all the time. And so I had my manicurist come up mm -hmm. and 60 women were interested. And so she came up every week for about three months. And uh, by the time the three months were over, there was about 20, 20 women. Mm -hmm. And then we just, uh, got a bus and we sent them down to Sacramento where they <laughs> went to beauty school because you have to have a license. Right. And, uh, That's a great story. And so they did that. Uh -huh. And from then on, they went out all over the United States. <laughs> 20 it women. A movement. 20 women. But uh -huh. I want to tell you, words, you know, travels right. fast. And I talked to one of them, and my God, she he was driving a Cadillac. She had uh -huh. a, you know, she had a hundred thousand dollar home, and that was in the right you know, when it was a hundred thousand dollars. When it was, right. it was a hundred thousand dollar home, and they were just uh -huh. doing such amazing work, Good and they're so you. cute. I still stay in touch with with oh, some of them, and it's 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 so cool. And um, uh, every time I go into another city, and I uh -huh. you know drive by one of the Vietnamese. You know, salons. I right. just kind of smile inside. And go get a, go in for. They a don't know that you know. <laughs> and I've done that. I've gone into salons uh -huh. and, and um, uh, you know tell them the story and yeah. and then they you know they kind of. They know. Yeah. Right. That's it terrific. Was really, it was good. That's really yeah. good. Good for you. Um, yes. Oh, yeah, thank you. In uh, 1969, I believe uh, you do Tiger by the Tail. Uh, around that time. It was around that time. time. Could you tell us about uh, working on that film and how it seems to have changed your life? No, no, to no, no I, you're, I, I think you're thinking about um, Satan's Harvest. Okay. The one I did in Africa. Yes. I did two films in Africa. Okay. I, I did this uh, these two films and I really wanted to do uh, the first one. The second one came about because of the first one. Right. But I wanted to do, the, do it because I really wanted to go to that continent. Right. And uh, was with uh, again the late George Montgomery, mm -hmm. and uh, but there were wild animals in it mm -hmm. because it I haven't seen it in a long time, but it had something to do with with smuggling drugs and you know animals in some mm -hmm. way. And um, where in Africa did you go? Uh, we went to Bites Bridge mm -hmm. in um, um, uh, Zimbabwe. Okay. Now it's Rhodesia. Mm -hmm. No, now it's Rhodesia. It now it's Zimbabwe. Right. It was Rhodesia. Yes. Uh, so, and we were on location there, which mm -hmm. was great fun. And, and uh, uh, I met my first lion mm -hmm. outside of a zoo, and his name was Dandelion. <laughs> and uh, it was an amazing thing to see when you know when you're on a movie set. There's a lot of time to wait, sit around, sure. and uh, it was you know hot, and a lot of the crew were sitting on the ground and. Uh, the assistant director said, would everybody please rise? The lion is coming through. And I thought, oh, we're going to pay homage to the king. You know? <laughs> and uh, in point of fact, it was, uh, which I later found out after I, this brilliant view of this lion walking across the veld with his human friend. No, uh -huh. no chain around right. him, nothing. They just walked side by side. And they walked past all of us and wherever they were going. And... Uh, I later found out that we were asked to stand up because when you are below the height of a lion, I want you to all remember this, <laughs> that you are very apt to become either prey or a toy. Mm -hmm. Neither of which no. anybody really wants to do. <laughs> uh, but it was, it was, you know, it was really when lots of cheetah were in the film mm. and uh, it was pretty, pretty wonderful. And then I did uh, another film called Mr. King Street's War with mm -hmm. John Saxon. Mm -hmm. And the late Rosanna Brazzi, mm -hmm. which was what a wonderful, wonderful man. Well, they're both great. Um, but during the time that we were there, we went to the game preserves to see the animals, mm -hmm. and it was always so beautiful to see it. And during that time, 69 and 70, in the beginning of the 70s, environmentalists were really making it very, very, uh, they were just announcing everywhere that if we don't do something right now to save the animals mm -hmm. in the wild by the year 2000, they will be gone. So a lot of awareness was going out. Remember we heard about the whale, the mm -hmm. panda, the tiger. And um, so my then husband uh, being in a producer, he was executive producer of The Exorcist. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, so we thought, well, let's do a, a movie about the animals in the wild. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's a rather large kind of mountain to climb. Yes. And uh, after uh, seeing a house on the Gorongosa Game Preserve in Mozambique that had been abandoned by a game warden because it flooded during the rainy seasons, it was taken over by a pride of lion. And it grew to be the largest pride in all of Africa. It was mm. just amazing. All lions of all sizes, the big manes all the way down to the little cubs, sitting in the windows on top of the Portuguese style <laughs> roof. They were uh, sleeping on the verandas, going in and out the doors. One was in a dilapidated old por porch mm -hmm. swing. You couldn't go near that house. We worshiped them from afar. But we put that, we took that idea and used that as the centerpiece for uh, our movie Roar, mm -hmm. which we immediately upon uh, coming home from the second mm -hmm. film, uh, the script was written and we started interviewing lions to do the movie because we fully intended on having um, Hollywood acting animals have a nine month shoot over and out. Mm -hmm. Well, the powers that be said, no, that's not the way it's gonna go. We had, uh, because of the tremendous number of animals, there were close to 28 or 29 lions living in that house. That's the way the script was written. And as soon as the trainers read the script, they just laughed at us and said it can't be done because of instinctual dictates to fight. Mm -hmm. And he said, I don't want my cat hurt. I don't want to be hurt. Get your own animals to do the movie and um, introduce them carefully. Mm -hmm. So that's what we did. And within several years, we were becoming a very important facility to uh, California Fish and Game, mm -hmm. the Department of Agriculture, the SPCAs, the uh, humane societies, private citizens who had purchased a little darling little cub, not much cuter than that, mm -hmm. and uh, find they can't handle it. I mean, it, they can't be handled. It's how did how did it go for you that here you are creating a project? but eventually it becomes a passion for you. I mean, was there something that was that touched you? Would you describe that, uh, that something that is really, it's such a, you know. Actually, uh, there's, there's a lot of things that, that were uh, pretty, you know, uh, I mean, just the fact of the way some of these animals had lived before mm -hmm. they came to us uh, was, you know, tragic mm -hmm. and sad. Uh, some of them had been living in literally hovels, mm -hmm. you know, down underground. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, some, well, we have one who was living in a basement outside of Branson, Missouri. Mm -hmm. And there were children in that house. And I, you know, I mean, there's so many kids right now who have been hurt mm -hmm. so terribly by these animals. Um, but there's a, a little uh, black leopard. Uh, Leo is the one who was living in the basement, mm -hmm. and he he has been our poster for our for our membership. And uh, there's a little black leopard mm -hmm. named Kara, and she was she was abandoned in a garage in the bitter cold month of February in Wyoming. Mm. Yeah, all four pads were frostbitten. She had she lost six inches all off her tail from frostbite. She, why her ears were still there, we don't know, because the, the ears mm -hmm. went in situations like that. The ears just break off. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, there, uh, very recently in Colton, California, there were some, some of you may have heard about this, the 90 big cats that were being starved. I know my, my docents know all about that. Uh, but uh, this man named John Weinhart was, didn't he kept breeding these tigers and the mothers were so undernourished, they didn't have milk. They'd see the cubs, you know, nursing. Mm -hmm. And um, if, uh, if one of them survived, it would be amazing. But then he'd put, he'd put the rest of them in the freezer. Oh. They found close to 13 or 20, I can't remember the number, carcasses on his property. Oh. The legs tied like this. Oh, how terrible. And they were skinned. Oh. They found skins in a, in a van. Uh, they found uh, at one point, uh, uh, so they, they, one day Fish and Game called mm -hmm. me and he said, at 10 o'clock in the morning, and he said, Tippy, can you take 13 tigers? Mm -hmm. I said, no, I don't have room for 13 tigers. Let me find out how many I can take, because mm -hmm. I knew this man, right. this John Weinhardt. I had been to his place, 
and left in tears and furious. Where was Fish and Game? Where was the Department of Agriculture? Why were they just letting him go? I mean, my God, they come out to Shambhala, and if we have one nail out of place, they write you up. So I was, I was angry with him for a lot of reasons. And um, um, at one, so anyway, we were able to take three of those tigers, mm -hmm. and I named them after my grandchildren, mm -hmm. Alexander, Dakota, Del Carmen, Stella Del Carmen, mm -hmm. Banderas Griffith, and little Dakota, <laughs> and um, yeah, the, the female, the woman gets the last name. It's Banderas Griffith. That's good information. Good, yes, it is. Yes. <laughs> so anyway, um, uh, we the three came at four o'clock that afternoon. Wow. And we alto ultimately ended up with mm -hmm. with uh, eight mm -hmm. animals from there. Uh, the, there were two, uh, a fishing game got another call saying that uh, somebody reported a tiger in a small cage with no water on the veranda of his house. So they went to the house mm -hmm. and, um, you know, took the tiger into uh, Fun for Animals. Mm -hmm. They were taking care of him. And they went into the bathroom and there were two caiman alligators living in there. Now also, John Weinhardt and his woman have had, at that time, a little, a little boy. Mm -hmm. um, He's about eight years old at this time now. When I went there, the child was a lot younger. And um, so they saw the Cayman alligators and took them out, and they heard scratchings up in the ceiling. So they undid the vent, and the little tiger fell out, oh. and two weeks old, and fell on the floor and was killed. Oh. But there were, there were nine little tigers and two, uh, two little leopards, mm -hmm. all under the age of two weeks. And we have two of those. Cats. They all come in, they all, every one of them that we took mm -hmm. had pneumonia and horrible skin problems. Terrible skin problems. Did they put him in jail at all? Well, he was, uh, he was ar arrested. Uh, to whom am I speaking? Oh, okay. Yeah, um, uh, he was arrested and they, um, uh, last March, I think it was, this hearing started and I went and testified against him because I saw the way he was treating those animals about six years ago. And uh, when I went in, our photographer was with me, and somebody else, and I can't remember who it was, doesn't matter. Um, but there was uh, there were no, uh, no evidence that these animals were cared mm -hmm. for. I mean, they were thin, they were, you could see the ribs. The water was uh, supposedly served in the tops of trash cans. You know, they're about this mm -hmm. deep. Bone dry. We ran around with hoses just filling, you know, just knowing that at least they'll have some little sip of water. It was hot. There was no shelter for them. Um, there were feces everywhere. You could smell the place 300 feet away. Mm -hmm. uh, there was uh, dead chickens, green with mold, feathers. I mean, it was, and outside, garbage. It was like they had put cages up in a, a, a trash mm -hmm. dump. Hmm. Now, uh, I know that you are being an activist to lobby in Congress. Yes. Sir. Is that correct? Would you yes. tell us about what you're doing with that? Yeah. Um, about seven or eight years ago, I was called in as a consultant to the state of Michigan because they wanted to make their laws uh, more stringent. Mm -hmm. uh, they have a big problem with not only the big cats, but the wolf dog. Right. It's huge numbers of them being bred. Mm -hmm. And um, it can be a very dangerous animal. Mm -hmm. So they wanted to change their laws, and they, they brought me in. Well, I took the bill that they had uh, to Washington, and uh, it was put into mm -hmm. a federal bill rather than a state bill. Uh, and um, unfortunately, the, the congressman who was helping me wasn't mm -hmm. reelected, so I had to start all over again. Mm -hmm. But I found um, uh, Tom Lantos, of Nor Northern mm -hmm. California mm -hmm. congressman, and he had the same beliefs that I do, mm -hmm. that these animals, you know, should be regulated. They shouldn't even be born in the United right. States to be sold as pets. It's just folly. And uh, so he uh, he introduced the bill, mm -hmm. and it was thrown out by the head of the committee of the Department of Agriculture because he was from <laughs> Texas. I don't take this personally, any of you Texans, but uh, there are more te tigers mm -hmm. living in people's backyards in the state of Texas than exist in the country of India. Oh my goodness. There are more canned hunts. Do any of you not know what a canned hunt is? No, tell us what it is. Okay. It's a facility that takes in uh, exotic animals and mm. for anywhere from three to twenty, thirty thousand oh, yeah. dollars 
with a weapon of your choice for a head on the wall and a rug on the floor. This is a guaranteed trophy. Yes, it is. It's, it's unconscionable. And what's your challenge? Is it automatic? There isn't any. There isn't any. And what is even, even worse, which fortunately has been stopped, is the internet hunting, where they'll have a sharpshooter in a particular area, and you can sit in your back in at your sofa and say, okay, pull the trigger. So where is... Where, and then they send you the body. So where is this... Uh, where are you now with this bill? Where I am... Toast? Okay, where I am now, uh, in 2003, we got a bill passed called, uh, called the Captive Wildlife Safety Act, which my own... My own congressman, Buck McKeon, introduced. Mm -hmm. And I had to really work on him a, a lot of years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, we were at a, at a, um, a film festival mm -hmm. in Santa Clarita. And I said, Buck, I'm, I'm, I want to work on this film, mm -hmm. on this, this um, bill that I want to get mm -hmm. passed. Would you help me? And he said, oh, sure. So I went to meet with him in Washington. And I said, well, here I am. And I want to talk to you about the bill, and I want your support. And he said, mm -hmm. well, Tippy, I've got to look at it. I've got to study it. I've got to do that. I said, okay. Would you look at this four-minute video that mm -hmm. I put together? Uh, I was told not to make it any longer than four mm -hmm. minutes. And so I did. It wasn't easy getting all that into a four minutes. And uh, it's called Wild Animals Are Not Pets. And I said, would you just look at this? And mm -hmm. he handed it to his aide. Mm -hmm. And within 30 seconds, his whole demeanor changed. And Buck said, yes, mm -hmm. I'll help you. He introduced the bill. And um, I went to testify, mm -hmm. which is interesting to do. That's where your acting comes in, folks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because the people who were testifying prior to me, and they were, they, they were, they were all animal-related mm -hmm. bills, but they were different kinds of bills. And you have five minutes to get your point across. What you put in the congressional record can be 30 pages or you can a mm -hmm. volume. But you have five minutes. And all of these people were reading. And they weren't actors. And the congressmen were talking amongst each other. Right. And they were going, one got up to get some coffee. And I thought, well, I'm not going to do that. And so I took my paper and set it on the, table, the desk and I said, a four-and-a-half-year-old boy had his arm ripped off by his uncle's pet tiger in Texas. They retrieved the arm, but sewed it back on, but he can't use it. He'll be in the sling for the rest of his life. And a little 11-year-old girl went into the cage with her stepfather to groom his tiger. The tiger jumped her, bit her in the neck. She was instantly dead. <laughs> and I went down about mm -hmm. 15 accidents. Mm -hmm. And I just said, you know what? You are the only ones who can stop this. You. And uh, it passed in the House unanimously, mm -hmm. the Senate unanimously. And on December 19th, Bush signed it. <laughs> so, you know, it's interesting, too, because, you know, people, people say that we're not in the right climate for any, mm -hmm. any animal bills and that sort of thing. I said, we weren't in it when Clinton was there either. So, sure. And this is, this is a nonpartisan issue. Yes. Totally. Now, do you have a, is there a website? Yes, Shambhala.org. Shambhala.org. Yes. Good. So people can yeah. uh, log on to that and find out more about what's going on. Absolutely. And we, we have a tremendous number of wonderful programs. We have an adoption program. Chris Link is head of that one. And she has been doing, how many years, Chris? Oh, 12. Oh, 12. Yeah, is that it's a, a leopard it's shirt a, you have on? Of course. <laughs> 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 and uh, uh, the ad adoption program is really wonderful because when you adopt an animal, you leave it with us, first of all. And then you can come and visit your wild one the first Saturday of every month, and you learn about the, the, the species that you've adopted, and then you learn the personality traits of that animal, and that's where it gets good. And it's wonderful. We have a membership program that's excellent, mm -hmm. and we have parties for the members. A uh, school program that's excellent with the Unified School District, where uh, we go to the schools, and the schools also come to us. And uh, what we're trying to do is teach the kids that know wild animal is a good pet, whether it's the little squirrel in your backyard, 
Can you provide him with an acorn tree so he can run up and down it and plant those little acorns wherever he feels like and then can't find them again? No, not hardly. <laughs> can you give an African lion a, an African savanna? Can you give a tiger a, a jungle wolverine, riverine area? You can't. No. There's nothing we can give them that they need. And I, you know, if you could feel in your heart to write to your congressman and your senators, write to Boxer, write to Feinstein, and just say, you keep reading about these accidents and hearing about them. Most recently, a little 10-year-old boy in Minneapolis went with his father to meet, to go over to another friend mm -hmm. of his father's house where he had 10 or 11 mm -hmm. tigers and lions. Wow. And... Uh, Oh, they're rampant. They're all over. They're right under your nose, and most of the time we don't even know it. But he took, he let the cat, the tiger out. The cat mm -hmm. went and jumped the little boy, and instead of shutting the gate, he went to help the little boy, and the lion got out. Both the tiger and the lion got the little boy. The little boy is now a quadriplegic and will be on a respirator for the, his remaining days, whatever that is. We want to take uh, some of the actors have uh, written some questions for oh, us okay. to, for us to take. And maybe we'll take some questions. Sure. Um, I got an email from someone uh, asking me to ask you, uh, how did you get the name Tippy? My father gave it to me. And that's your My that, real name is Nathalie. And, um, Nathalie? Nathalie. In my first marriage, I was Nathalie Griffith. <laughs> <laughs> Say that very five times fast. I was really glad my father. My father did couldn't see calling that little six pound seven ounce baby right. Nathalie, so he started calling me Tupsa, Tupsa. which is a Swedish uh -huh. uh, little term of endearment. Right. You know, so that eventually worked out into into Tippy. Um, and were you? But also, I have to, I have so to tell you something else. So it crossed out on my birth certificate, uh, written in as Nathalie, but crossed out Babette. Uh, if there's any bad bets here, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Let me let me get a question okay. from uh, this is from uh, Terry Kiefer. Where's Terry? Is Terry still here? Hey, Terry. Hi, Terry. I'm uh, not crying. I have an, an allergy. And both Trudy Farley, who works in in my office with me, we both have the same allergy, and uh, neither one of us have been able to find a doctor to cure it. Is there a doctor for that? Anybody? Else? We'll pass it on after. Uh, here's a question. Terry wants to know, did you name your daughter after your character in The Birds? No. Melanie came first. Oh, you read it afterwards. Okay. Well, you should. I'm okay. spending all this time on film. As a, uh, I want to go to question number two then. How do you feel about having to wear, mink, uh, wear a mink coat in The Birds? Uh, I, was, oh, I, I, if I had, if oh, I, if I had known what I know now, I, obviously I would never have worn it ever, ever. You know, it's so it's uh, you know once you once you become aware of of um, all the living creatures on our planet, you know they're not they're not uh, put here to, for us to look glamorous in. No, it looks much better on them. Now you keep mentioning this girl named Melanie. This right? Melanie. This Melanie. This Melanie. This Melanie. This now Melanie Griffith is a. a Fine, wonderful actor in her own right. Yes. Uh, very much so. Were you, uh, what was your feeling about her wanting to become an actor uh, when well, she was Well, you know, you know, I was really surprised uh -huh. because uh, being an actor in films is not, it's not all red carpets and Klieg lights, which you all know. It's getting up at five and sure. six and many times working into the night and, uh, which I have to tell you, Hitchcock spoiled me terribly because he would work only from nine to five. Wow. Have you anybody heard of that? <laughs> Is that amazing? Well, yeah. As well, we, we always wrap before six. Well, that's good. Excellent. <laughs> Thanks that's for fabulous. sharing that. Yeah. <laughs> Within his contract, he never worked one day. Robert back. Young. Yeah. He's a smart man. So, like that too. They what? Yeah. Anybody else want to throw one in? A name or two? <laughs> you know, name droppers. Uh, so uh, when she wanted to be an actor, I mean, was this a discussion? No, I was, I was, I was really surprised because right. the, just the hours alone, the responsibility right. of carrying a picture, um, uh, sometimes working with, with people that, uh, you know, there are a few directors who don't know what they're doing. Sure. 
Most. And, uh, you know, to have come from a director who uh, felt that the whole film was finished before he even started filming. And he was so positive of how he was going to edit mm -hmm. that he never, you know, he didn't overshoot ever. We ha rarely did more than three takes, four right. takes. And, um, you know, so some of these directors that I've heard about, fortunately, I've never... I've never had to work with somebody who went into right. 30 takes or whatever. I don't know. That, I, you know, Capricorns can be very blunt. And I think if that ever happened to me, I'd say, listen, when you get your act together, you call me. I'll be in right now. Good for you. Yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> now, did you, offer, uh, did you offer Melanie advice uh, mm -hmm. uh, from... Uh, or did you guide her along at all at the, uh, as a mother? She knew. Well? She knew a lot about the you know how right. motion pictures are made and how hard it is and and how disappointing it can be at times. Right. And uh, she, uh, I didn't help her at all. She went with a friend of hers who was going to a meeting mm -hmm. um, uh, for uh, night moves, mm -hmm. and it was for this particular character mm -hmm. who was this young, sexy little little girl. And they told the, her friend that she was too old, but they looked at Melanie and said, hmm, look at mm. you. And uh, she came, Melanie came home and said, Mom, I went, saw, you know, I went on an interview today with a friend of mine. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, that's nice. And then she said, they've called me back. You know, so I thought, oh. And then she got the role. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went with her for a while, but they have a, you know, they have the, the teacher. Teachers on the set. Yeah, mm -hmm. on the set. But she did an amazing job mm -hmm. in that. But it, you know, she she saw how hard it is. She wanted to do it, and she went to after after several films. Mm -hmm. She went to New York, and um, lived there and right. studied with Stella Adler. Mm -hmm. Would you, in your relationship with your daughter, uh, talk about acting at all, uh, uh, acting problems, or uh, from being a more experienced actor than she was in the beginning to? Give her a talk to her about how to handle certain. We situations. did. We did talk about about acting, but right. I, I I don't think it was it was never the kind of thing where I would give her advice on right. on you know um, feedback on her work. Yeah. yeah. Uh, forgive me if if I don't know the answer to this, but have you worked together? We have you acted we together? well, yeah, in our movie Roar. Oh, you, that's right. Yes, and that film, our nine month shoot was five years. <laughs> Oh, and Melanie was so funny. All of a sudden, you know, your, your hair grows, you know. For some she of cut us. it off. Yeah, she cut it off. <laughs> <laughs> a little joke of mine. She, <laughs> she cut her hair off. Right. You know, and I just kept the same hairdo for right. five years. It was painful. Um, <laughs> and uh, but Melanie had come in, so we got a mm -hmm. wig for her. Right. Oh. Yeah. Okay, let me, let's get to, let's see if we get to one or two more questions here. Uh, Mark Pavia, Mark still here? Hey, Mark. Uh, on average, how many takes did Hitch do per setups on the birds? Oh, I think I already answered that. Okay. The one time he did 13 takes was the scene where uh, um, Suzanne Plachette and I are talking about Mitch Brenner, and I was supposed to pick up the cigarette, mm -hmm. pick up the lighter, do you know all these all things, right. and it had to be timed with the conversation and you know all of that and phew, it was and he was kind of grumpy that day right. anyway so it was um, that was the longest and also during that scene Sus Susie and I got the giggles <laughs> now what do you do as an actor when you get the giggles you, there, just you, get, there, just you get know it. you know that there's hardly anything you can do to control okay. it right no, you can't isn't. all you have to do is look at each other and go <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's just terrible. Yeah. And just keep giggling until yes. you Yes, and that crew standing around going, <laughs> okay. Oh, those actresses. <laughs> <laughs> it's terrible. Uh -huh. Here's a question from Barbara Fisher. Barbara? Hey, Barbara. Uh, Marnie is one of her favorite films. Um, how, well, you mentioned how it was working with Sean Connery. What kind of preparation did you do for that role? Uh, first of all, I read the book, The Winston, um, um, Marnie by Winston Graham. Uh, it was an English English writer, and uh, I think I, I I was able to nail the character so completely by reading that book 
because so much went on in Marnie's head that, that you can't get across in a film, mm -hmm. but it helped me tremendously to, uh, to have that in my, in my head. And she was so complicated. She was so complicated and such a mathematical genius. You know, she was, she was an amazing woman. Uh, but how sad for her, you know, I mean, what a tragedy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a question from uh, Kelly Ford. Kelly, still there? Hey, Kelly. Uh, what did you think of the Chicago production of David Serta's The Birds? Will you come to the LA production? It's better, <laughs> I promise. Listen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, I, I am going to be there, and I Are you in loved it. it. Oh, yeah! yeah. <laughs> there you go. Yes, I'm going to. I am going to. I am going to be there, and uh, it was one of the most fun nights I've spent in the theater. And it was uh, in a little house on the bay, on the on the lake. Cold. It was so cold, and the heating had gone out. That was the night I was there, and. Um, but they used this house, and they used all the doors, the windows. They didn't have to build a set at all. They used everything. It was and funny. It's a great characters and characterizations. Wow. Where are they doing Brilliant. it in L.A.? Uh, I have to go to work. Okay, hand them out later. <laughs> uh, they're doing it at the McCadden, uh, on the North McCadden Place. And um, it's Thursday through Sunday. And uh, it's a, a no intermission. It's about 90 minutes. And it's a lot of fun. Uh, it is fun. Reviews Mixed. Hey Rock says that it's the funniest thing I've ever seen, and backstage laughing since the big vulgar atrocity of sexual perversity. So. <laughs> <laughs> Which it is. Yeah. Well, congratulations. Oh, yeah. No, it's really fun. I'm glad to see you. It's yeah. wonderful. Yeah. Here, here's a, a question from Charlie. Yeah. Hi, Charlie. Charlie is, how is your charming daughter doing these days and her hubby? Uh, and the grandchildren. And the grandchildren. They are absolutely wonderful. They are. Is she doing anything today? She's going to be starting a series called Twins. She is. Yes. Here in LA. Yeah. Good. Okay. Warner Brothers. Hmm? It's in production. It's in production. It is in production. Yes. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, is anybody in the audience uh, from our conversation want to raise their hand and ask a question? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes. I have written a book, and it's basically about the, the wild animals. It's called The Cats of Shambhala. Uh, it's, uh, there's been three printings, and I'm going to do a final, another chapter, another added chapter. And um, I'm going to change the title to The Wild Ones of Shambhala rather than The Cats. Uh, and um, I have someone who's going to publish. Simon & Schuster published it first. You can you sometimes find it on the internet. Uh, yeah, okay. And it, uh, um, Simon and Schuster did the hardcover, and McGraw Hill did the soft cover, and then I uh, retained the rights. So it's uh, still in hardcover, but published by me. Good for you. Yes, sir. Yes, I have a question. Uh, what is your opinion on how they answered or how they handled the tiger that was escaped last year? Um, well, I don't know that you've ever seen a madder bunch of people than at the Shambhala Preserve when oh, that happened. Oh, it was just horrible. It was, it was absolutely awful. Yeah. There was no reason for no. that. The two, two veterinarians from the Fish and Game, who are excellent, were not even aware that the tiger had been shot till the next day. <laughs> there is a, there is a, a process called Telinject which a, a, a wild animal can be tranquilized from almost any distance, whether it's six feet away, 200 feet away, whatever. They sure had those sharpshooters out there, four sharpshooters. The animal was, didn't have enough energy to hardly move. It had, it had lost half its weight. It had nothing in its stomach. It was just a really awful thing that happened with fish and game. And they are on the carpet for it. We've been having hearings about it. And, um, uh, it, you know, it's a little dictatorship up there. So. Yes, sir. Hi, Tippy. Hi. I'm a cat lover as, as much as you are, maybe even more. But now it's trickling down. You just heard about the, the lady that had the 300 cats at her house. And they went in, and there were 
regular felines. Yeah. And 80 were dead. And now this thing, it's with the Wattweiler that killed the little girl. It's trickled down to, to, to the little ones now. And so what do you, what do you think that can be done about uh, that? I don't, I don't know. I, uh, since I've been so heavily involved with the animals, I've, I've heard many people who have way too many cats and there's something wrong up here yeah. when that happens because, uh, because you can't, you, you, there's no logic there. There's, there's no real love for the animals. There's nothing. And I, I don't know what the answer is, whether, uh, whether it's more enforcement of laws because in most areas there are laws that you can only have so many dogs and so many, uh, I don't know how many, where I live, you can mm -hmm. have as many cats as you want, mm -hmm. <laughs> as you can afford. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Really? Yes, ma'am. I was just curious, have you ever been involved with PETA before? Uh, not really, no. And there are a lot of reasons for that. Down here, Bob? Uh, OK. OK. Nina Diamante, uh, is there a way to fix it so that anybody who maltreats an animal could get 40 or 50 years imprisonment for doing so? Uh, is I, there any place that yeah. has laws that protects the animals in this uh, way? I am also a cat person. They, they are, there are laws, and uh, if you're Give within, the, with, if you're within the, the, dist the area that the laws pertain to. In most states, there is no laws against having a wild animal. But as mm. far as, the, as the, um, um, the sentences, John Weinhardt, for as bad and how awful he was to those animals, he is getting two years. That's all? Two years in jail. And uh, you know how if they act, pretend they're OK, they'll let mm. them out. But he has five years probation, and uh, he cannot own any animals. Have you any connection to the Lang Foundation? Uh, Lang, I can't remember. Pardon me? It's in Westwood. It's in Westwood. I'm not. Uh, it, it offers free neutering oh, animals. Yeah, 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 yeah. What, what's, her, what's her first name? I know that place. Uh, yes, I do know. Why don't we let's see Julian. if we I'm sorry. Let's yeah. see if we can get uh, one or two more questions. Sure. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Hi. One, you're gorgeous. <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> and also, years ago, uh, maybe it was like 15 years ago, I went to Shambhal. I was delighted uh -huh. to do so. And it was uh, when you were having the fundraiser and Freebo played. And I saw a Vietnamese pot belly pig. Yes. I don't know if he's still Sir with Winston you. Sir Winston Churchill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> is Sir Winston still with you? No, he isn't. Oh. He, he's in the... Shambhala heavens. In the sky. But he was so amazing. And he, I named him Sir Winston Churchill because Churchill loved, greatly admired the pig. And he said, the, the cat looks down upon you. The dog looks up to you. The pig, however, thinks of you as an equal. <laughs> <laughs> but I have never met a smarter animal in my life. There and you had another question. And yeah, and I know you have an elephant. Is that correct? Uh, we, do, we had two, a circus elephant, a cow. And she died about five years ago, four years ago, from a uh, uh, massive heart attack in the middle of the night. Mm. And we just lost Timbo, and I can't talk about it. Okay. And I just was wish if you could share what other animals you have given Big cats to. and, um, the, you know, we did just had the elephants, which were uh, uh, beautiful. Yes, sir. Hi, Tippy. I was curious, are you a smoker? Were you a smoker then? And with the laws today, would you have wanted to smoke in the film or would you have requested not to? Okay. Do you think an actress should take it that far or an actor? Yes, I do. Um, because I don't think smoking it has to be with any, any character. I don't think that's, I don't, I don't think you don't have to smoke to be a character uh, unless you're dying of lung cancer. Uh, but I started smoking, uh, my parents would have been stunned if I'd been smoking. I started when I was 21, and it was because of a Chesterfield commercial. And uh, money talks, you know, it's stupid. But I, that's when I started, and of course there were no, uh, no ideas that it would be so harmful. But I remember the day that in, I was, it was, we were almost finished with Marnie, and the cancer reports came out. Mm -hmm. And uh, Melanie was, you know, listening to the radio, and she was listening, watching TV, and 
And these things get through to little kids. And she said, Mommy, you could get, you got to stop smoking because you could, could um, become very, very ill. Mm -hmm. You could die earlier. You could look older faster. I think that's what did it. <laughs> <laughs> and I put that cigarette out and didn't have another one. Hi, yes, sir. I'm Stephen. Um, but the Birds is one of my favorite films. Um, I noticed there's a lot of kids in it, yes. and particularly Veronica Cartwright. I was wondering <laughs> how Hitchcock dealt with her in the filming of this, and kids in general. Uh, he, he, uh, gosh, he was he was really good to her and fine with her. I don't. There was never a problem, and you know you can generally tell if there is a problem with kids and what their, you know, if they've been talk to in a disreputable way or not. She's wonderful. As, she's as, very good. She's when you're she driving was, away in the car. I mean, she, and she's crying yeah, and yeah, yeah, she telling really that story. Time. Oh, yeah, it yeah. makes me cry. Yeah, it was really terrific. Yeah. Uh, well, um, on behalf of the Screen Actors Guild Foundation, I want to thank you for your acting work and your activism. Uh, on behalf of all of us, it was a real joy to get a chance to sit here and talk with you. Well, thank and so, you. on all of us, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. And good luck to all of you. Thank you so much.